Okay, and and I'm gonna set up the live stream, and I'll let you know once once we go live. Okay. Okay, I thought we were live. Or you mean? Well, we have people in the room, but we'll we'll be making a um, to the Facebook. We'll be doing a live. Stream. Oh, they're not they can't see us yet or hear us. No, not yet. Okay, <laughs> that's good to know. All right. Uh, while we're waiting just a few more seconds, just to let everyone know there's closed captioning available. We have a closed captioner here with us named Catherine. Thank you, Catherine, for doing that for us. And you can find that in the bottom menu to turn on closed captioning. Lots of tribal people signing on. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Right. Good evening, all my relations. I just see all these different nations signing in here. Yeah. Wonderful. We are live. Oh, did you say we're live to begin? Okay, thank you, Allie. Um, good evening and thank you all for joining us tonight for a discussion of the remarkable film, We Still Live Here, about the extraordinary restoration and reclamation of the Wampanoag language to the Wampanoag people. We hope that you've had a chance to view the film, but if not yet, the film will remain available to you for viewing through November 30th. Just use the same links that were provided in the email. We are honored and delighted to have as our speakers tonight, Jesse Little Doe Baird, Mashpee Wampanoag linguist and co-founder and director of the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project and filmmaker, Anne Makepeace. Before I introduce them, I have a few words about logistics. My name is Ann Gilmore, and I will be co-facilitating this discussion along with Ali Tharp. For about the first half of our hour-long conversation, I will pose questions to our speakers. And during that time, you are invited to post any questions you may have into the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen. Ali will be monitoring this, and during the second half of our time together, um, she will then pose uh, as many questions as she can coming in um, from you, the audience, to our speakers. Um, Ali is the program director of the UU Ministry for Earth and manager of the Create Climate Justice Initiative. And she is a primary envisioner and organizer of this week long Harvest the Power, Justice, Convergence, and Teach In. And now on to our speakers. Anne Makepeace is a writer, producer, and director of independent films. She has written and directed a dozen multiple award-winning documentaries from her first Moonchild to her most recent Tribal Justice, a film about the little known efforts of tribal courts to create alternative justice systems based on their traditions. 
Her films are powerful stories about often overlooked people, especially those from indigenous cultures. The film we are discussing tonight, We Still Live Here, had its broadcast premiere on the PBS series, Independent Lens in November of 2011. This film has won many awards, including the Moving Mountains Award for the film most likely to affect important social change. Jessie Little Doe Baird is a Mashpee Wampanoag linguist, best known for her groundbreaking work in restoring the Wampanoag language, which had not been spoken for over a century. She has served as the co-founder and director of the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project since 1993. She is also an elected tribal leader serving as tribal council vice chair. She has received many awards for her work, including one of the 2010 MacArthur Fellowship Awards for quote, extraordinary creativity, originality and dedication and a marked capacity for self-direction. She received an honorary doctorate in social sciences from Yale University in 2017. And just this year, she was chosen by USA Today as one of a hundred of the most influential women of the century. Jesse, um, starting with you, the, um, one of the tribal members in the film um, talks about how it wasn't really the language that was lost, it was the people that were lost. Do you agree with that? And how would you explain that? Um, well, I think it was um, Chiefy um, said that an elder told him that. And um, I think um, what was being said is that typically in the field of linguistics um, and in um, the field of anthropology, you will hear um, folks in the field say that a language is uh, quote unquote dead. Um, and this, this is a real problem um, uh, because, well, number one, Wampanoag people um, consider that language was created for us by Manat, by God. Um, and um, it was created for us to communicate with the rest of creation. And it is a part of the community like any other um, creation in, in the community. Um, so if, if someone outside of the community says that the language is dead, um, um, then they are acknowledging that this is number one, a living com um, uh, community member. Um, and if it's dead and you have another camp saying that um, language defines culture, and language is dead, then they're by extension saying the culture is dead. And if the culture defines the people, then by extension, the people are dead. Um, and so um, it's, 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 um, it's a disrespect, but it's more ignorance than anything else because um, it is an uh, uh, outside, uh, it's an outside position. It is not um, culturally centric people get to decide um, how their language lives in the community. Um, and so there are times when the people can lose their way from their community members, um, lose their way from the way of doing things. It doesn't mean that the person they've lost their way from or the tradition they've lost their way from um, has gone away. It's just that their focus is not the focus is not there. Um, and I think that's what he was trying to say that um, language was created for us by Manat. Language has always been with the people and the people had always been with it. But for a long time, the people were not having an active relationship with language. And I think, I think that's what he was trying to say there. Thank you. Um... So I'm curious, um, and how, um, what led you to create this film? How did you and Jesse meet? Um, what were some of the choices you made about how to tell this story? 
So I was actually working on a different documentary at WGBH, um, uh, and that was a historical documentary about King Philip's War, devastating war that happened in the 1670s, um, in which um, colonists, uh, you know, there were a lot of horrible things that happened in, the, in that war. But um, when I met Jesse, I was just, uh, you know, completely blown away by who she is, what she was doing, what she was, you know, accomplishing, the, the mammoth task she had set herself and the, 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 the language uh, program members had set themselves to bring back this language. And so um, it wasn't in the, in the film I was working on, there wasn't really a place for contemporary stories. It was all based in the past. That project for me fell apart, and Jesse knows all the ins and outs of that story, but um, it was a kind of a devastating moment for me in my career. But then it's one of those situations where one door closes and another door opens. I thought, well, isn't the real story, this story of uh, a native people taking control of their lives, taking agency, um, reviving, a part of them that, as Jesse mentioned, had you know sort of gone out of focus, and that, and you know, and also, my films always need <clears throat> a central character to kind of lead the audience through that the audience can identify with, and and of course Jesse was just a, a fa fabulous uh, person. There was always a tension between us, though, because Jesse kept saying, it's not about me, it's not about me, it's not about me, and I kept saying, but I need a central character. So that was, you know, that uh, was a challenge, but um, but I, actually it led to uh, making the film better, because at some point Jesse said, okay, this is probably a year into filming, okay, enough of me, but she encouraged other members of the community to participate. So what you see in the film, at the beginning of the film, it's kind of, you know, it's pretty much focused on Jesse, but as you go, it widens out into the community. And at the end, you see the community, um, you know, in the, in the, um, at the language program camp, I guess you would call it, um, all learning together. I think there were, I don't know, 60, 70 people there. So, um, so that's kind of the story of, of how it happened, and uh, yeah, it, it, documentaries never turn out the way you t envision them at the beginning, but sometimes they turn out better, and I think that was the case in this in this instance. And I'm, it's very thrilling for me that um, the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Program uses the film for fundraising and for educating people, and and that's just a, a real blessing for me. Yeah, you mentioned, um, you know, needing to have a central character. And I know, Jesse, um, despite all the awards that keep pouring in for you, you're always putting the attention back on the language project, the tribal communities, the language learners. Um, it seems, how, how would you, um, I mean, we live in a culture where the, or the dominant culture actually um, is so oriented to individualism and celebrity culture. Um, can you describe you know, how you envision this whole process of language reclamation and the different roles that have been played by uh, ancestors and tribal communities mm -hmm. um, along with the actual teachers? Well, I... Um... I think um, one of the things that um, we try to um, help people understand is the nature of language for the, for the Wampanoag um, as actually being an active part of community. And um, so language um, is um, a privilege. So um, language is given to you as a privilege to, um, as a code for what's in your mind um, to be expressed to others um, through language, whether it's auditory or sign language, it's a privilege. But it also carries a responsibility because um, 
language needs to change just like cultures need to change and people need to change. And in order for that process to take place, it has to be used. It has to be um, actively engaged and relevant. And so while it's a privilege, it's also a responsibility. But in order for that responsibility to happen, in order for us to carry that bundle to, to where we're, we're supposed to, that requires an entire community. So um, it's not that I'm ever trying to say, hey, um, don't focus on me. Um, what I'm saying is an actual fact that language um, cannot be language without everybody. Um, so it's everybody that has to work um, and it's everybody's language. And um, we have um, a prophecy about language, a time when language would go away. Um, at one point, um, another community, um, Delaware um, community from Canada came to visit us um, and they brought the language pipe home. Um, and there they have their piece of the story and prophecy and um, over 500 years ago, um, it was foretold that there would be a time when the language is not living with the people um, and a time when language could again live with the people if they chose that that was time for that to happen. Um, and um, I was working in social services in the early 90s and um, I had a series of a vision that lasted me three nights. Um, and in part of the vision, um, I think there had been, a, I was seeing a, 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 the aftermath of a sickness, but in a modern time, um, there were houses along the bay and um, the water was very still, it didn't move. It, it seemed like things even in the water were dead and everybody's yard was burned off and it was still smoldering. Um, but the houses weren't burned. It had been purposely burned off because of some sort of sickness. And um, I knew I was in a vision. I knew I wasn't asleep, but not awake, but I couldn't see anybody to ask what's happening here. Um, and I looked to the right and I saw a yellow house far across a field and it had a bulkhead in the back of the house open and there was light coming from, from um, the basement. So I thought maybe somebody there could help. And I went to that place um, and uh, uh, this vision is really what spurred me um, to say, hey, let's talk, let's talk about language coming home. I went down into this place where I saw light and the room expand, it expanded um, maybe 20 or 30 times the size of the house outside. And there was a large circle of um, people, but they were circles of different tribes making a circle. Um, and the first group chanted something and then the second group joined in and then the third group said the same thing the third time. And it went this way around. And I walked around the outside of everybody's um, um, chant. And when I got towards the top again, um, I recognized a group of my own family. Although I had never met them, I could look at them and see that that was my clan, that was my family. Um, but I just hadn't physically met them yet. And for some reason I became very afraid. And so I got as low to the floor as I could. And I thought I could sneak by them. And, and they had a large book spread across their lap. Um, and they were still chanting um, the same thing. And um, so I tried to get by them and for the first time I heard English and one person said, but what does it mean? And another person um, said, ask Jesse, she knows. And it startled me. And I said, I really don't know. I have no idea. I'm sorry, I can't help you. I don't know what that means. Um, and they said, that's too bad because we really can't let you leave until you tell us um, 
So I thought, well, I better tell them what I think it means because if I, I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna get the hell out of here unless I tell them. And I said what I thought, which was, we're still here and we're still with you. And everybody said, of course. And then that was it for that portion of the vision. And I, I really didn't understand why for a long time. Um, but um, without going through three days worth of vision, I will tell you that um, what they said to me was not, we're still with you, we're still here. What they said to me is, we, we've been killed with the yellow thing. And I, I had no linguistic training. I, had, I didn't know anything about language at the time at all, except for it hit me seeing a street sign, um, a place name on a sign that that's what, that's what I was hearing in my vision. Um, um, I was hearing two words and I couldn't find those two words when I started doing research, but I couldn't find them because words are entire sentences and I didn't know enough to be looking for sentences. So while they were telling me that they were killed with the yellow thing, and then I later found out that um, two thirds of our nation died from yellow fever between 1616 and 1619 before the Mayflower even got here there was um, a pandemic, an epidemic here. Um, so they said that we've died, but my response to them was, but we're, we're still with you and we're still here. And I understood that that's my people um, speaking to me. Um, and part of, the, part of our prophecy is that the um, children of those who were here when the circle of language is broken those children will work together to close it. And when I started my graduate um, program um, in 96 at um, MIT, it wasn't until I think a year and a half in that I was talking to um, Professor Ken Hale about this prophecy that he disclosed to me that he was a direct descendant of Roger Williams, um, one of the first documenters and missionaries um, documenting the language um, in the 1600s. So. Um, um, but, you know, so much more is involved. Um, the elders of the community had to decide that this was something that we were ready um, to do again. Um, so, and we were working with multiple communities um, and having to find ways to make sure that politics didn't seep through the work. Um, and if they did, how do we get around these things and keep our work moving forward? But, but it's everybody, it's everybody working. It's still everybody working together really hard. Our teachers, um, Natana Hicks Green Deer is credentialed now. Um, Tracy Kelly is credentialed now. We have Montessori teachers that are um, credentialed Montessori teachers. Um, we have state certified teachers. So we have 13 employees and um, teachers that are teaching our children. Um, we have um, Melanie and Tracy in the high school. The kids can go to high school now mm -hmm. and they can take Wampanoag one, two, three, and four for a world language credit. It's just wonderful. Um, and, that, and, and that's taken um, 27 years of a lot of people working hard. Yeah, sometimes people think you just, you, if you have a vision then everything's gonna be wonderful. Well, you can, you know, you can see a lot of things, but you're still, you still have a lot of work to do. Um, a vision is a, a picture of what could be. You still have to get from here to there and you need everybody to do that. Well, as you're speaking, I just get this sense of um, the language reclamation as this healing process. So, mm -hmm. Um, just, I mean, all the, um, you know, the atrocities that were revealed in the, in the film and that we also know from the history of, um, of, you know, violence and plague and dispossession and removal from land, from family. Um, there's so much emotion in the, that's 
jumps out from the film. Um, I think, um, Anne, you did such an amazing job of, um, you know, presenting the, what happened in the past. I mean, you didn't have footage, video footage or photographs, but you did it through animation and music and just um, reading those uh, so-called confessions of the people and what they were having to, the choices they were faced with, you know, giving up their land, their, their homeland or adopting Christianity, having to, you know, cut their hair because that's what being a Christian meant. I mean, I just, anyway, I mean, does that ring true to either of you that it's really a story? It's a, it's a story of many themes, but one of them is healing. That's certainly, it certainly seems like it to me. I would certainly um, agree with that. And as, as uh, both of you were talking, I was remembering when I first went to Jesse and, and asked whether this would, the, making the film would be possible. And it was shortly after the GBH project had fallen apart. And I met with Jesse and Linda Coombs, who's in the film. She's not in the film a lot, but she's very, very important uh, supporter uh, of, of getting the film made. At the time, she was the uh, director of the um, Wampanoag Indigenous Program at Plymouth Plantation. And, you know, she's a historian and Wampanoag. And so um, we had lunch somewhere, I can't remember where, but, uh, and I, I, I proposed the project and it was very sensitive at the time because the uh, language program members had a policy that they would not uh, allow the language to be used in anything that could be sold. Um, uh, and Jesse can correct me on, uh, maybe I'm not articulating this part very well, but as I remember, um, people were looking at the language as a child that, that was coming back and that needed to be cared for within the community and not yet shared with the world at large. And so um, anyway, at this lunch, one of the things I said to Jesse and Linda was, you know, before we go any further with this, if, if you guys are on board, and then of course we had to uh, present to the whole language program. But I said, you know, there's something that you should know about me and that my direct ancestor participated in King Philip's war and participated, I know specifically in the uh, what's called the Great Swamp Massacre. And so there's historical, you know, I guess guilt or there's wrongdoing back in my own ancestry. And Jesse, without hesitation said, well, you're closing the circle. And that I've that just moved me so deeply. It was such a large way of, of seeing that uh, history and conflict. And that was a healing thing for me. Um, and then just to finish the, this part of the story. So then I did have a need to make a presentation to the whole language program. And I think there were maybe, I don't know, 25 people there, Jess. Um, this would have been in sometime in uh, kind of late 2007. And it was such a passionate discussion in you know, both directions. Some people said, really felt, we're not ready to do this. We're not ready, you know, and people said, do we want people to see us struggling to speak our own language? Because they were learning, you know, learning a language involves, you know, trying and failing and trying again. Um, but I remember very clearly Jason, Jesse's husband, made a very eloquent speech, beautiful speech about, I mean, I'm not going to do justice to it, but basically maybe this is the time, maybe we're ready. And he said it so eloquently that the committee then, I believe unanimously agreed to go forward with the film. So there's a lot of healing in that story for me. And uh, also totally, I was, I was and am totally honored by being entrusted to to tell the story or to to be the channel through which the story could come out into the world. That's how I see it. Yes, I, I, I would I would um, I would agree with Anne um, that it's that it's been very 
a very um, cathartic work for everyone. And um, people are still um, some, somewhat protective, but maybe some of the same reasons. But initially, I think um, some of the comments, I think we had a, about 60 people on the committee at the time, and um, they felt like they didn't want language to be yet another indigenous um, something that could be commodified um, and that could be put on and taken off like so much jewelry or something shiny. Um, they didn't want that to happen. Um, and um, they also felt like um, they, they didn't want the shame of um, having been for since early 1600s um, and still today across the country, um, people get questioned about their Indianness. How Indian are you? And then there's also um, CD, uh, CDIB cards where your certificate degree of Indian blood and um, there's blood quantums and there's who's more Indian than whom. And um, people in the Northeast have been, um, had to have contact and we consider contact still happening um, the contact experience is still ongoing today, have had the longest contact experience um, in our unceded territory. We still consider we are an occupied people. And um, it's a miracle that we're still here. And um, the idea is if we can make you less Indian, then you're less of a victim, then there's less of a crime and then we don't have to look at it. And so, um, one of the things people did not want to happen is to have someone who's not Wampanoag or not of a Wampanoag household, because a lot of our students and speakers aren't Wampanoag. They happen to live in a house with other Wampanoag people. They could be from whatever background. Um, they did not want to see them being speakers and they themselves could not speak because they felt like that would be another way to say you are less Indian because I'm not Wampanoag and I can speak your language and you can't. And, um, and so people were afraid of that. Um, and then the other reason they um, wanted to keep it close was simply a resource issue. I mean, for about the first 15 years, the only um, expert we had to work every day and stay in the, in the community and teach um, every week was me until we got an ANA grant and we could expand to speakers. Um, things are a little better now. We don't have to be so stingy with resources. So, um, so we can do things like going to the high school and you get the same bang for the buck. You know, it's not costing you more money. You're in there already and it's okay. Um, so people are more relaxed. Another thing that they're very cautious about is that they don't want the language to be used um, um, to talk badly about their own people. So if um, somebody's making a film or something and they want to make it more authentic, maybe put some Wampanoag in there. The community wants to approve what is going to be said. So if we're gonna be using our own language to talk crap about our people, that's not gonna work. Or to um, marginalize our folks, that's not gonna work. Or to stereotype our folks, um, that also wouldn't work. Um, so, so those are some of the issues we still deal with. Um, but um, Anne's right, it, it was, um, poor Anne had to run the gauntlet to, um, I think, do the work, but, um, um, <laughs> but she, she did an incredible job and um, the community was really thankful in the end that she was able to um, put up with us for, how long did it take? <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I, I proposed the idea in April of 2007. We actually started filming in September of 2007 at the powwow. That was the, the, the actually the powwow that ends the film was the first day of shooting. And the film was finished in late 2010. So, was, uh, you know, it, but that's, that's kind of how it goes with documentary because there's so much bloody fundraising that has to happen. You know, you shoot a little bit, you edit. A, a sample piece, you submit proposals, you hope to get another, a little more funding, and then, you know, it sort of goes on and on like that. So, um, so that, that's part of the reason it took so long. But, uh, you know, I think, 
branching out into the community and um, you know interviewing people like Chief Lopez and uh, Chiefy and oh uh, I can't remember you know uh, it took time it just took time to um, to and and when you're making a documentary you never quite know when it's done you know like what what's the end I don't know it doesn't end life the, the story doesn't end obviously um so i can't remember what made me say okay we're done but um you know it's a very rich thing for me to have a relationship with people in the wampanoag community with jesse and others so mm -hmm. uh yeah i i it was a hard hard one trust and i'm honored to have to have won it and uh to still be in touch with my friends there Thank you. I mean, speaking of fundraising, in the spirit of reciprocity, I want to invite our listeners. Um, maybe, Ali, you can put a link in the uh, chat for the Wampanoag Language Reclamation Project. Um, I invite you all to go on the website and see the amazing, wonderful work that's being done um, and make a contribution. Um, donate to the Wampanoag Language Re Reclamation Project. Um, there's so many questions I want to ask you about the language itself, what the language reveals about the world views of your ancestors and your people, Jesse, um, what it reveals about the role of women. And, um, but I want to give others a chance because I, I see the time is uh, moving along. So at this point, I would like um, Ali to come on and um, let us know what are some of the questions that are um, showing up in the Q&A for our speakers. Sure. Um, so people are very appreciative of everything you've shared already. And I think that some of the questions um, you've already kind of spoken to, um, but people are curious about your daughter and how learning the language so young, you know, how it, it kind of carries with her and has affected her to be a, you know, one of the first native speakers um, since that young in age and how, and also I think people are curious, you've spoken a fair amount about what's going on with the language project, but anything you haven't shared yet about what y'all are doing that's really exciting. People are very curious to learn about that. Um, and also about, you know, um, that people wanna keep learning is, are there resources, things you've published beyond the film that people can learn more about your work and the work of their the language reclamation project? Um, I think um, there may be um, uh, things at WLRP's website um, that you can go to learn a lot um, about what we're doing. Um, there's the um, Makaisak Wiku, which is a um, preschool and kindergarten um, Montessori model where um, it's a CBE culturally based education where children um, learn subjects in Wampanoag. Um, and then there's the Widamu school, which is for the upper grades. And we've gotten up to grade four thus far, although um, COVID's put in a nice, put a nice wrench in, um, in that. So we're slowed down. Um, as for May, um, May is more of a very good passive speaker, although she will, um, speak, I guess, when the mood strikes her, but um, she is a typical 16 year old um, and she's, you know, too, too cool for her own good. <laughs> um, and um, I think that um, it's brought a lot, uh, obviously to me, she's a very intelligent young lady, but uh, she, she may have come that way anyway, but um, I will tell you that um, having children um, acquire other languages as early as possible um, greatly enhances brain elasticity. It doesn't have to be an indigenous language. It can be any language. It's very good for children. Um, and I would say for folks that are wanting to bring this um, into their local school system, um, set a meeting with your local school board and um, you might have to sort of um, do the work yourself at first and say, hey, we would like to um, offer you a, um, a school curriculum 
um, give them curriculum to um, approve. Um, and we will, um, we will give you the teachers or you can help us, we will help cover the cost for the teachers. Um, and communities can teach whatever's in their local community. Um, so you will be surprised how many um, experts there are in your local community that can speak a, a language other than English. And you can offer that in the local high school um, and it will um, greatly enhance um, your children's lives and um, their ability to acquire knowledge, um, I would say. Um, um, Tracy Kelly um, is just um, put up um, Canusi. Um, it's not completely live yet. So Canusi means talk to me. Um, and it's a new web platform that the Language Project has where people can engage in all levels of language learning remotely. Um, and we've needed this for such a long time. It's one of the blessings that has come out of COVID for us was sort of pushed us to have more um, online platform um, that people have been asking for for a number of years. We're also still always adding to the dictionary, but right now we're at the point where we need to put um, all of the inflections in, um, inflect the verbs and things. So um, there's about 12,000 headwords in there, but they need inflection. So that's the next pot of work. Um, we're also doing a lot of editing and publishing. So um, the teachers um, in the community are writing books. We're creating our library and then we meet on Fridays, we edit the books um, and, we, and we talk about making new words um, or do we let the kids just make the new words? Um, what do we do? Um, so we have that editorial board um, that happens every Friday. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, there's always prayer books and song books and um, people are using the language now in their sobriety. Um, trying to be clean and sober, um, they're using it there. Um, most meetings are started in our language now, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and there are lots of songs. Um, the tribal court uses the language. Um, it's uh, it's really very it's 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 an inspiring thing to see happen. One of the really cool things that happened recently was that I got. Um, um, a text message from someone who was checking on their inflection and asking me, did I get this right? Or is there something else I should have? What they sent me was really good. There were no problems with it. And I didn't teach the person. Mm -hmm. I was not the person's teacher. And so it's now to the point where we've got enough teachers that are out there teaching elders, youngers, we just got a grant for our child childbearing age folks so that we can get them more engaged with the kids. That's super exciting. Um, Jennifer Weston um, is from Lakota and she um, is our um, project director who goes out there and gets all of these wonderful grants and programs that keep us expanding. And so that's our next new thing. But to have people out there learning and doing such a great job and speaking and you you haven't taught them, um, I that just makes me really excited. Thanks so much, Desi. Sorry, I just um, go on. You have to like, shh. <laughs> never. <laughs> um, I do, I kind of want to go back to what Anne said she wanted to delve more into and it's also kind of reflected in one of these questions respecting and acknowledging that not everything you've learned is something that is some to be shared freely with the whole world and and the colonial world you know acknowledging some things are sacred to the tribe um are there a few examples you could share with us about the way the language um reflects the culture the wampanoag culture sure um so um, hmm. so one thing that I think that, that I find um, fascinating is the translation of the King Eliot, um, the King James version of, of the Bible that was supervised by John Eliot, but translated by Wampanoag speakers. 
I find that document fascinating for a number of reasons. But one of the main reasons is that the translations are not just transliteral. They're, they are, you can see where speakers are reading a story in English and they're saying, oh, they mean this. And when they say they mean this, the this is what is possible from a Wampanoag cultural perspective, not necessarily what the English writer would have would written. And of course, this happens every time there's a major translation of anything. There's been um, five major translations of that particular book of the Bible. But the Wampanoag translation and, and spaces I find very instructive. Um, for example, um, in st instead of saying, uh, and, and, and um, God made the waters, there's a story about the different types of water that's made. And in one story, there is the ocean water, right, the salt water. And then the story says that there is a land in the middle of the salt water. And within that, there is the unseasoned water that was made, meaning the fresh water and how the unseasoned water was made. And when things um, were created, um, so there's different ways to say create. There's Kisatiao, um, and then there's Kisakyonsen, um, and then there's Iam. And so, um, but there's a way of saying, so something is um, God, I am Ahki, God made the land. Um, but there's a way of saying that something was started here. It was created. Manat, I am, God created it, but it started here. And after a long time, it was finished. And so um, in that way, you can see that from a Wampanoag perspective, this particular thing was started this way, but it wasn't finished until over here. It sort of took its journey until it was finished, which I find fascinating. Um, and then there are places in there where um, a different verb is used that a, a, a Christian translator would not have used, but the Wampanoag person is saying, no, 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 this is what happened in the story. And I think um, um, one of the things that people miss a lot of time is that people typically think that because Christianity was brought here by Christians, that the Christians brought God to Wampanoag people, but that is not the case because um, things that were not here, the words are borrowed. So English does it too. So you have this um, beautiful pastry um, that you can eat and it's sort of shaped like a half a moon and it comes from France and you can have it with your coffee and we call it a croissant. Beautiful word. Why make a new word? Let's use the French word for the thing, croissant. And we use it in English all the time. So languages borrow words all the time for things that weren't there. Um, but in this, in this document in the Bible, so there's things like ruby sash. That means rubies, there were no rubies here. Diamond sash, there were no diamonds here. Goat sock. That means goats, there were no goats here. Pig sock, there were no pigs here. But manat is manat. Kahtanat is kahtanat. So the creator and the Holy Spirit, they are, those things have words. They're not borrowed. Um, there are these concepts that are already here. And I think Wampanoag people are saying, hey, let's listen to what these guys have to say. Let's see what they have to fill in our holes. And then when we translate this, we make sure we translate this properly though. Um, and so you learn a lot in the translation. Um, one of the things that um, the language does also is it can inform you about something that you do, but you didn't know why you did it. So for example, um, still today when people pass away and, um, you're at a burial ceremony, um, people place pine in the grave. They will put a tuft of pine in the grave. Um, people will offer that. Um, and in our language, gua, um, pine is animate. Um, and this, the film talks about the first 
men and women that actually respected and loved each other were made of pine. And, um, and the pine trees reward for that is that it gets to be green all year long and it doesn't turn brown and die like other trees do. And that pine is the symbol of everlasting life. And so all my growing up, we put pine in a grave and, and you don't think about these things because it's just what you do. Um, and when something that is endemic to your culture, um, you may not think of it um, when you're raised doing it, but um, studying the language, I started to make these connections. Oh, I get it. Okay. So um, our people are writing about pine being animate and why it's sacred. And we're still doing that. Um, and it's amazing that culture can still happen outside of the language even being used. The physical action of putting the pine in, in the grave is still happening today. But what um, welcoming language home has brought us is some answers to why we're doing some of these things. And I think that that's very important. Um, and at this time, I want to pass it back to you to close out with any, you know, kind of last final questions or discussion that you would like to. Um, let's see, do we have time for you to say a bit about the role of women um, in your culture, Jesse, and what the language reveals about uh, the role of women? Um, well, um, not a short topic, I guess, but <laughs> yeah. Um, but the you ladies, say something about the language, you know, the word. Well, the ladies get it done. I'm going to start with that. <laughs> well, I'm saying it politely, but the ladies get the work done um, a lot of the time, but, it, but we need our men too. Um, but matamwasas is like complete, a complete say in judgment. And that's the word for woman, matamwasas, complete say in judgment. Very important um, because we wanna have good men. We wanna have strong men. We wanna have respectful men, but we have the say in judgment. Father's not typically around raising them full time. Things are different now in modern times, but traditionally um, we relied on men um, to um, do the heavy lifting. And so because mom is breastfeeding, mom is right attached to the baby. Dad can't breastfeed, mom's doing the feeding, mom's doing the teaching. So it's very important for the woman to have complete say and judgment and for men to recognize that because we're raising the men um, and we're raising the women. Um, so um, we also have, um, I think the English had a hard time with this at uh, initial contact. We have Songkyum, which is a male leader and we have um, Songshkwa, which is a female leader. Um, and the English weren't used to this. I, it was a big shock for them. Um, it was also a further shock that um, a woman could have two husbands or three husbands, um, a huge shock. Um, and then she could also have um, my sweetheart. So you could have a sweetheart, not necessarily a husband. Then you could have this husband, this husband, and this husband. Um, and um, women were very powerful um, leaders in their communities. Um, they still are today, um, but they um, sacrifice so much um, for me to be here to use my language today. And um, one of those women, um, Widamu, our school, Widamu school is named after her. And that means she is sweet. Um, and during King Philip's war, um, Widamu, um, who one of her husbands was Wam Sada, King Philip's brother, um, she was leading her troops across the Taunton River and um, she was captured by the English. Um, she was known for her beauty um, and her sweetness. Um, it, it is written that she had wampum from her wrist to her shoulders and she was tall and beautiful and always um, adorned beautifully um, and was an incredible fighter and an incredible leader of her people and a lover of her people. Um, and um, she was captured at um, Wishkwa 
they call squab betty now, but we squabs. It's, it means shaped like a bottle. It's a narrow part of the Taunton River that she was crossing with her troops. Um, and at that time, right prior to King Philip's War, English women were starting to get really cranky with their husbands. They were saying, hey, you're calling these people savages, but their women own property. Their women are leaders. Um, their women are not um, beaten and chattel. Um, we're wondering if maybe we wanna go move into the forest and be like those women. Um, and it was, it was really starting to cause some friction in the English community. And when Wiedemu was captured crossing the Taunton River, um, they wanted to make an example of her. And uh, they stripped her of her wampum. They wrote about stripping her of her wampum and her beautiful clothing. Um, and they mutilated her body by removing her breast. Um, and then they severed her head and they stuck her head on a pike in the center of Taunton Green um, for 20 years as a reminder to white women and Wampanoag women alike to not be in a position of leadership, to not stand up for their land and to not stand up for their children. And she, she laid her blood down for me she laid her blood down for my son, for my daughters. Um, her sister was our shanks. Our shanks, um, they made a deal with our shanks if she would stay out of the war and take her people to a neutral place and not fight. After the war, she could come back to her homeland. And um, our shanks was from um, the Pakin, larger Pakinakad areas. So just it means a place of cleared land where there was large scale farming, um, and there were several vi villages in Pakinakad. Um, she took her people from there, and she sat out the rest of the war um, in Mashpee. And when she went to go home, um, Captain Benjamin Church informed her that they ran out of money to pay people that fought for the English. So back then you got paid to fight a war and they had to pay the Indians in land because they didn't have any more coin. So the other Indians that fought on the side of the English were paid in Awashong's territory um, in the Pakanakad area. And some of those folks stayed in Mashpee and those were the Pakanet, so the Pakanet, which was my family line. And so, um, so these women are of my blood um, and um, but for them, um, I, I, I would not be here today. And so um, language is no less important to me than the land under my feet. And when we say my land, we say natahkim, not the word is ahki land, but we, you don't say nataki, you say natakim. And that M at the end means not separate from my body. Natakim, I am my land and my land is me. Um, and so as a, a vice chairwoman of my nation, my entire goal um, is not talking my land. I want my land and I want my, my land for my kids to stay under my feet and, um, and stay Wampanoag land. Um, because if you do not have a community, a place to be, then it's really difficult to have language. It's difficult to have school. It's difficult to have gardening. It's difficult to have food sovereignty. Um, it's difficult to have powwow. It's difficult to have social. Um, you need your land. Um, everything springs from that. Um, and our women throughout history um, have, 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 have stood their ground um, and have stood in the gap. And, um, and I give them all respect. Well, I want to give both of you such respect and love and thanks for speaking with us tonight and sharing so much. And um, Jesse, what you've done and, and Anne, the, the film that you created to share this story, um, give us so much hope for, for the possibility of reconnecting um, 
with ancestors, with values, with a life affirming culture. Um, and I am so thankful for all that you have done and continue to do. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Jesse, you're doing your ancestors proud, you and your community. We're trying every day. And you're doing it. Every day. Thank you so much. It was uh, really great to be with you all. And um, uh, what a brilliant group of women right here. <laughs> right. <laughs> right on. And Anne, you should, you have to, you have to now fess up that you've been my language student and, <laughs> and, and a wonderful one. And, oh, um, and, and, and as, as the mother of a wonderful Wampanoag um, daughter. Um, um, so she was keeping that secret, but um, oh, thank she's you, a Jessie. fantastic student too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I, thank you all so, so much. Right. Bye.